Before I even get started on this presentation, I want to say an intimate and detailed thank you to everybody in this room for what you do for a living. We are currently in the middle of a, of a movement and a pivotal part of the movement. And if it wasn't for everybody in this room and everybody in this conference and everything that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, we would have zero traction. We have single-handedly picked up a broken industry, flipped it upside down and shook it, okay? We are making change and we are not gonna stop making change. Our foot is on the gas and this is how we're gonna do it. I believe that this presentation is gonna be a wonderful outline of how you can make that change even without some of the resources that ultra-funded agencies have. This uh, presentation is called From We Can't to Why Not. And I believe it's more of a story. It's more of an arc, right? Because it is a true reflection, A, of a real place in America. This is not one of those situations. This isn't a Houston, right? We're gonna be talking about Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Pine Bluff. And this is going to be a true reflection of most of what America is. And I'm super pumped to be able to be up here. Not, I am too. Not only because, uh, look, Marcus isn't a colleague of mine. He's not a work uh, colleague. He is that. But more importantly, he's a friend. And so I'm, I'm super excited to be here and present yes. next to a friend of mine. I've never had this opportunity before. So let's go ahead and jump into it. My name is Nick Walton. I'm the Senior Manager of National Shelter Support with Best Friends Animal Society. I know that is a mouthful. And I'm not going to sit here and tell y'all how many times I had to practice that in front of a mirror for it to come out <laughs> clean, okay? But dang it, I got it. Uh, what I do for a living is I basically have the opportunity to travel the country. A lot of the times I travel virtually, but uh, meeting with agencies of all different shapes and sizes to provide assistance. That assistance comes in many forms. It can be assessments. It can be mentorships. It can be resources, actual factual resources or grants. Um, and, and one thing that I can say about my job, what's up, y'all? <laughs> yeah, 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 there's my boss. Sorry. Yeah, you're good, no worries. Our general session was awesome. Yeah, we're good. This is going to be an authentic presentation, y'all. But one thing I get to meet, uh, one of my favorite parts of my job is I get to meet people across the country who do this for a living. And that's actually, this is actually how I met Marcus. Hi, my name is Marcus Graydon. I want to get this out there. I'm not a public speaker. I've never done this. So if I stumble, pick me back up, please. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> um, but I do want you guys to understand that this is from the heart. And we didn't get to where we are overnight. So if anybody is in the shelter environment and think that this thing is going to happen overnight, you're sadly mistaken. But what I do want you guys to understand is that with dedication, you can get over it. Thank you. Welcome to Pine Bluff, everyone. As you can see, we're not a big city. We're not a Houston. We don't have metros or millions of highways. But what we lack in size, we make up in heart. With that being said, Pine Bluff is actually growing. Along with Pine Bluff growing, animal services is growing as well. And we're doing that one nose at a time. We're saving lives one paw at a time. So we want to say we are making changes there. 100%. And, and look, I don't know. There's going to be a lot of applause in this one, man. I love this group. Let's go. One thing I say about Pine Bluff, not only do they have the best casino in the country, <laughs> and I say it's the best casino because it's the only one I've walked out of with money in my pocket. <laughs> it's a normal casino. I just got lucky that day. So I got a special spot in my heart for Pine Bluff. But on a real note, the people of Pine Bluff are so kind and compassionate. It is a true small town feel. And oftentimes we use the small town as an excuse to not be able to sustain life saving or even get to the point of life saving. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping through this presentation we can all take away something from this presentation to say, no, there is no excuse. We can do this. We can absolutely do this if we have the drive and the perseverance. Speaking of the past, uh, so this is 2019, obviously, and in the past, a few years back, I actually was able to come out to Pine Bluff to do an assessment. When I was out in Pine Bluff the first time, it was, was kind of sad. You know, it was a, the energy was off. Uh, people were not invested in their jobs. It was one of those situations where you walk in and you just kind of get hit with that energy, right? Before I move forward, I want everybody to look at these numbers and take a deep breath and think to yourself, 
what are the first thoughts that come to mind? When you see a shelter with stats like this, what are some of the first thoughts that come to mind? Is it anger? Is it confusion? Is it sadness? I don't know. You tell me. I want us to wipe that away and replace it with a form of empathy. Because what's happening in a shelter like this are people that are, are some of the most kind and compassionate people I've ever met come out of shelters with this kind of a save rate. Now, I will say, some of the staff there did not share your vision, Marcus. They did not. But on my first time there, one thing that stood out was Marcus's ability to persevere and never be, uh, never be complacent with where they were. He always wanted change. He always wanted to do better. He just never had the opportunity, the resources, nor the know-how to do so. And uh, I think that's a pivotal part of this whole thing, is having a leader that is not complacent and also quite transparent. Nick? It does say the past. It does. So we're going to show them what we did now. Let's go. So throughout this presentation, and I just mentioned people just a little bit. People are so important if you are trying to go through a period of change. Okay. Having that unified mission is without a unified mission, without the people in place to do so, you're never going to get there. And so I felt I would be remiss if I didn't include interviews from some of the staff in Pine Bluff. And so these interviews are gonna be about a minute, minute and a half long. Um, while this is playing, uh, just kind of sit back, relax, and listen to Sam Pittman. Who is Sam, Marcus? Sam is my right-hand man. Sam is actually my field services supervisor. Right. So these dogs, dogs, cats, any of the animals in our shelter, you know, they become like part of our family. You know, we're, we see them every day, we work with them every day, we feed them, we walk them, we love on them all. So we build a relationship with these dogs, cats, everything. Uh, have to euthanize for space, you know, it, it's hard. And we we talk, me and Marcus have talked plenty of times, the day that it's easy to euthanize is the day you need to look for another job because mm. it, it's not something fun. It's not something I enjoy doing. It's not something Marcus enjoys doing. Uh, doing for space is its one of the hardest parts of my job. It's knowing that this dog had a chance or, you know, and we couldn't do it. So now we, like I said previously, we're, we're pushing adoptions. Adoptions are up. We're pushing to get these dogs out. 99% of the time, what we're having to euthanize for, which is minuscule anyway right now, is for health and behavioral. If these dogs are hit by a car, if they are just horrible sick and there's no coming back from it, um, then it's a quality of life issue. We, we do it to benefit these animals more or less so that these dogs are suffering, these cats are suffering. So one thing about Sam Pittman, he's one of the coolest dudes. I'm so used to talking about a mic. <laughs> he's one of the coolest dudes I've ever met in my whole life. And he cares more about dogs and cats than I think everybody in this room combined. Now that may be a stretch. I recognize that. We got some powerhouses in the audience today. But that man right there genuinely cares. And he was there whenever there was a really low save rate. And now this is the type of person that's getting to benefit from these changes that are being made within this facility. Okay, he now has a new take on life. If you spoke to him a few years back, he'd be a totally different person than he is now. He's excited to come to work every day. So before I get into this, how many of you all had to euthanize? Show of hands. Is that something that we all like to do? No. It sucks. It sucks. But when I first started back in 2017, that's all we knew. It took me having to go through and visit different shelters in different cities and state to actually understand the sheltering aspect of wanting to save lives. And that's how we got here. After visiting shelters and getting ideas, I would bring them back to my, my then bosses and would tell them, hey, this is the idea that I got from this shelter. Can we do it? You know what my answer was? No. We can't. We can't do it. No. We're not going to do it. So I took it up on myself to do what I do best, compiling notes and told myself if I ever got a chance to actually be in, 
in a leadership role and or director, I would make those changes. Hi, I'm Director Graydon. <laughs> so, after becoming director, I started implementing a lot of changes. A lot of changes that would actually take this shelter from the ground floor to where we are today. How I got introduced to Best Friends was through a volunteer by the name of Janie. Janie introduced me to this lovely young lady, Miss Allie. Miss Allie, thank you so much for believing in us and just coming down and seeing what we are doing. Allie started pulling dogs and Allie would hear me telling, just telling different staff members and herself, hey, I'm new to this. I don't know what I'm doing. I need help. So Allie had this brilliant idea of introducing me to somebody. This man was charismatic. Um, he was just a total life-changing person. If you don't know who I'm talking about, it's Nick Walton. <laughs> Nick came in and said, Marcus, I've been hearing a lot about you and I do feel your pain. So I would tell him all of these ideas that I would have from different shelters that I would visit. But let me backtrack for a minute. There's somebody else in this room that I want to give a major shout out to because I started visiting shelters, but it was one shelter that actually stood out to me and I wanted to mimic myself after. It was Cabot, uh, Cabot Animal Services, Mike Wheeler. Mike, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for every tool that you gave me in making my shelter successful. I couldn't do it without these people that actually was there in my corner. So thank you guys from the bottom of my heart. Nick actually came in, Nick said, hey, we're going to start doing things that's going to actually help you guys with saving dogs and cats. He started coming up with these crazy acronyms of TNR. Nick, I have no clue what TNR, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> I didn't know. I did not know. Well, after explaining it to me, really wasn't on board, but that we're going to get into that a lot later. So Nick said, hey, have you ever heard of an embed? Again, he's coming up with these crazy words that I did not understand. No, Nick, I have no clue what you're talking about. Nick said, hey, you, these changes that you want to make with this embed program, it's actually going to help you. It's going to help you with doing your SOPs, implementing small medicals, medical changes and just the overall bringing up your shelter. Fast forward, there was a person that came into my life that I don't consider as a coworker. I consider her as a family member, Miss Kathy Overfield. We call her Kathy O. We call her Kathy O and if you know her, she is a little ball of fire that when she comes into a room, she demands respect. I wouldn't have it any other way. I would not. Kathy, you need to stop crying because I'm about to start crying up here too. <laughs> I'm just being real. I don't know if anybody's got some extra tissues. Hey, look, uh, speaking of Kathy, um, let's go ahead and hear from Whitney. Ma uh, Marcus, who's Whitney? Whitney is the first person that you see when you step foot on Animal Control's campus. She's my administrative assistant. She's awesome. She's All awesome. Right, let's see what she's got. Can you talk to me Ooh. about the impact that Best Friends has had in Pine Bluff? Oh my, oh my gosh. So I know it's called Best Friends, but let me tell you what Best Friends did. Best Friends sent us our new best friend. Kathy Overfield <laughs> is my new best friend. That is a relationship that I will carry forever. Aww. Not just for Pine Bluff Animal Control, but for our personally, like me personally, like we relate on so many levels. Like I'm so thankful just for her as a person because she has been our biggest cheerleader. She has been my personal big, biggest cheerleader. She's changed my life, basically. Um, we last weekend I went to New Mexico with her to do a transport. 
Uh, the dog that we transported in particular, when I was at HCO, I brought in as a bite dog, and I have been rallying for her not to get euthanized to be. We finally got her in the sanctuary in Utah. And it, it brings tears to my eyes because that dog could have easily, easily been euthanized. But Kathy helped get her to that sanctuary, and it was very special to me because she, that dog was, um, she's amazing. She's the best dog ever. But without best friends and without Kathy, that wouldn't have been possible at all. And along with every other dog that's gotten out of here, whether it be foster or um, adoption, and, you know, years ago, they they wouldn't have. They, mm. we, they would have been on a, a time schedule of, you know, they've been here this long, got to go, got to go. Give them the, the train tickets, what we call them. And... Right. We have not been issuing train tickets as much here lately, and I, that's mostly because of Best Friends Animal Society and Kathy. So real quick, I'm going to put Kathy on the spot. Kathy, do you mind standing up for us? Let's all give Kathy an overfield round of applause. She deserves it. She deserves it. Now, what this next slide we're going to be talking about is how no matter what support Pine Bluff, Arkansas had, the staff of Pine Bluff did this. It was not best friends. It was not any other agency. It was not anybody that came down to do an embed. It was not Nick Walton talking about TNR. The staff was sweating every day. The staff was crying every day. The staff was taking changes to the mayor every day. Okay? So I do not want any lines to get twisted here. The staff of Pine Bluff made these changes, and it was all led through Marcus. Um, 150%. Without any doubt. Um, and that's something that oftentimes I feel we need to clarify because we are not the ones that step in and save the day. We are the ones that step in and provide some resources and some training, some know-how. But what happens is the staff, they take it. And if they want it, they're going to move forward with it and they're going to run. Okay. Marcus runs. Anyways, I'm getting fired up up here, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, let me piggyback off that for All one right. second. I know that we didn't go over this, but as you see, that's the bite dog that she's talking about. That's Pretty Girl. Pretty Girl did not like men at all. She <laughs> true. hated men. But with a little time and effort, which we weren't doing in 2017, I'm able today, was able to touch her. As you can see, Sam is actually giving a kid in medicine. We weren't doing that in 2017. So this, all that you're seeing now is stuff that we're doing. Rehabilitation is key. Mm, heavy stuff. Now, when we talk about changes, right, we can talk about the nitty gritty, we can talk about the fine lines of how these changes get made. Um, but Marcus, do you mind talking to us a little bit about uh, the TNR program? And so I'm, I know you said just a second ago, like I introduced TNR to you and you were like, what in the world's going on? how do you feel about TNR whenever it first got introduced? I disliked it. I'm gonna be straight up honest with you. I, did, I disliked it because if you don't know anything, how can you understand something? So after Nick's constant pounding and training me, I was able to actually get a grasp of it and be able to take that to my superiors and get it past where we can implement the TNR program. TNR pro the TNR program actually helped us many ways. And if you're not doing it, please start it. Absolutely. Now let's talk about this. So when I, I remember when I first brought up TNR, his main concern was what is the public going to think? What is the public going to think about this? It's such a taboo concept. We're putting the animals back where we found them. That's not what we've done for decades. So how did the public respond? The public actually, they loved it. <laughs> they loved it. They embraced it with open arms because after getting the training and able to train the public, they said, oh, it makes sense. Because what you did in the past of taking this cat out of the community, it leaves a gap for another cat. So therefore, if you bring it back and it's actually fixed, it helps the problem. So they embraced it with open arms. You can tell he paid, paid attention in the training. Too. <laughs> yeah, I'll take credit for that. I'll take that credit. All right, let's move forward a bit. All right, we got another video with Sam. See what yeah, he's got to you say. You know, when I first started, we were Adoptions weren't pushed as hard as they are now. Um, our Facebook, our social media presence wasn't what it is now. Uh, 
it was just these dogs packed in kennels. We we were one to a kennel where I've heard stories before me. Sometimes it's two, three to a kennel, but we were one to a kennel. But it was almost to the point where weekly, maybe every other week, you know, we were having to forcefully put down for space. Um, right. You know, that's not something we've enjoyed. We, you know, we hate that because we've got a lot of good dogs that we've had to euthanize for space that. You know, had they been pushed the right way, they could have gotten out of there and found a home. So we're not we're not doing that. Um, we're pushing adoptions. Adoptions are up. Um, we're social media. We're big on our social media presence. And another big thing is vaccinating and medicating upon intake. Where when I first started, you know, we just bring them, stick them in a the kennel, and go on about our business. Where now every dog is vaccinated upon intake. Every dog is medicated. Something's wrong with these dogs. We notice throughout the day, you know, these dogs are addressed and treated the way it needs to be. So he mentioned here uh, vaccinations upon intake. We take this for granted in the industry. Okay, we oftentimes only see the agencies that have the robust platforms in place to be able to provide extensive medical care. Um, extensive is even a stretch. A lot of the times in America, and I'm not sure if everybody knows this, that's not the norm. America is huge. There are a ton of shelters out there that don't even have the ability to provide vaccinations upon intake. And so just by those little changes that, that are made over a period of time, you start to see a massive life-saving impact. So when I first started, we didn't have a medical budget. Zero medical budget. None. Nothing. As of today, we're getting $30,000 a year for medical. So that's with the hounding, the pressure, <laughs> and the just staying focused on making changes. So thank you guys for all the training that you've given us. Thanks to you, man. <laughs> all right. So I mentioned just a second ago, Right. There's so many changes that can take place, especially when you're working with Pine Bluff in, say, 2017, 2019. Right. It's like, where do we even start? But I think what's more important than the actual nitty gritty of these changes is the concept of perseverance and the importance of perseverance whenever you are going through a change or a period of change or a transition. And how do you manage that transition? If you do not have a persistent leader who is willing to essentially stand up for what is right, you're never going to get anywhere. And so we can talk about the how. I could probably do a whole presentation on how these changes were made in Pine Bluff. However, the one thing that you need to know is perseverance. Having a leader that is not going to stop when things get difficult. And that is who, who is up here on, on stage, quote unquote, with me today. Uh, let's hear from Whitney again. Okay, so what, what kind of changes have you seen, good, bad, or, or in between? Well, um, first of all, big changes was the director. When I came back the second go around, we had a totally different director, a different set of rules and regulations, and um, they were implemented instead of just told, you know, and talked about, they actually put them into force. So that made a huge difference. We had um, some ACOs here that are no longer here anymore. And the longer I was here, we had more, um, like the entire staff just changed. We got all new people. And just from that, I have seen a dramatic positive outcome. So, so what I got, what I got from that is twofold. One, uh, there was action involved with behind the words. Right. And yeah. so, you know, and this is common across the country. I think that we, we talk so much about what we want to do or what we're going to do eventually, whenever the time is right, we will do X, Y, or Z. Um, but it takes an agency or a director or somebody that can step up and actually do the change and, and show with action that the words mean something. And then the second part of that, I think, is super important, which you mentioned staff, people. Yeah. People people are the most important part of any animal services, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that we oftentimes overlook that and just focus on all the animals. But we don't really take a step back and say, how important are the people? So selfishly i put a lot of these videos up so i can get a water break i'm gonna be real with y'all um i don't know if y'all notice each time I'm, I'm sipping water um but there's a lot of meat to that or there's a lot of substance to that okay 
I believe first and foremost that whenever we're talking about people, and when I first went to Pine Bluff that first time, there was a completely different staff for the most part. The staff was not unified in a vision uh, and where the direction was going to go. The second time I went back to Pine Bluff for uh, my second visit, the energy was so different. People were so happy. People were excited to show me the animals that they had in their care. They were excited to show me how clean the kennels were. They were excited to show me the play yards with these dogs catching tennis balls. And Tyranny saying, uh, where's, is Tyranny in the room? I'm sorry, where's she at? She, she was in here. Anyway, she does a lot of work with behavior. And, you know, she was able to come out there and mm -hmm. work with some dogs. And I think through these situations, we start to see the staff gain that knowledge. And so that we can step back. And watch what happens is now that this staff has the knowledge and the resources, they can move forward with all of these nitty gritty changes. And that includes behavior. The people are incredibly important. So, the journey. <laughs> I'm laughing because you guys see that, that closed sign right there? That closed sign me, means a lot. It means a lot to me because that's the first day that Kathy Overfield ever stepped foot on campus. We were closed because we had a major outbreak. I can remember her calling and say, hey, Marcus, I'm around the corner. Um, there's a train on the track. How do I get here? So hey, that train in Pine Bluff is no joke, too. <laughs> I actually had to guide her back around to get there. And she said, well, why are you guys closed? Well, Kathy, I'm sorry to tell you, I, if they didn't tell you, we have distemper. If you guys don't never been through distemper, it can wipe your whole shelter. Kathy came in. This is what we're gonna do. She came in. I had a whiteboard sitting on the wall. She came and grabbed that whiteboard with a marker and she sat in the floor. She turned her back to everybody and just got to write. I've never seen anybody write this fast in my life. <laughs> this lady wrote, it seemed like forever, but when she turned this whiteboard around, she had devised a plan. And that plan was the what, when, how, whatever we needed to do, when we needed to do it, and how we needed to do it. This plan was taken to action then on separation of animals, what we needed to look for, and how we needed to go about with dressing and everything like that. After that, we were able to medicate medicate and more medicate something that we had never done and so you talked to me marcus about how this was a blessing so keep this in mind this is the first day of an embed it takes a lot to get an embed okay first day you walk in and it's a full-blown distemper outbreak it's like oh my gosh what am i walking into but what came from this was a total blessing okay this staff knows how to manage one of the most difficult things in the entire world to manage if you happen to be a director for an animal shelter. Distemper is no joke. Y'all got over it in how long? Two to three months. Two to three months. Two done. to three months. Dr. Erin told us that that was the fastest she's ever seen a shelter get over distemper. And it's because of training. What an what a awesome place for the embed to start. <laughs> because now the, now the staff has an absolute thorough understanding of medical. Mm -hmm. I mean, granted, they got tossed into the fire, no doubt. But they know how to do simple IVs now. Mm -hmm. They know how to do quarantine. They know the difference between isolation and quarantine. They know the booties you got to put on before you go into certain rooms. Like all of these things that we all have to know in these major disease outbreaks, the staff now knows. And so this is why it's so impactful for me. And it's impactful for Marcus, too, because this is about people. It's yes. about people and how we help animals, okay? And now the people in Pine Bluff are armed with knowledge. Whitney again, water break. <laughs> what would you say to an agency that is kind of looking at making some changes, whether that be through community cat programming or returning dogs back to their owners instead of impounding them into the shelter or providing breaks on impact? or whatever that may look like to you, what would you say to that agency that is currently on, on the fence with it? Well, there's, there's always, there's always going to be an answer. Um, I, I've been in that situation where I said I can't as well. And 
I, I feel for them because I, I, I understand that. Mm. When you don't know any better, you can't do better. Right. So when you reach out, you know, to certain organizations like Best Friends or Bissell or whoever, who have shown that you can do it, there's always going to be, you know, a, a solution to a problem, always. So even if, you know, you have to put in the work, of course, it's not going to come to you. You have to go out, you have to do your homework, you have to do your research. And eventually, I mean, it might not be right when you want it, but eventually that solution is going to be available. So um, we, we've done a lot of research. I've done a lot of homework. I study other organizations, their, you know, whether it be their Facebook page, their websites, I watch web webinars and stuff like that, just trying to, you know, gain more knowledge. And it works. It works, but mm. you ain't going to get far if you don't put in that work. You ain't going to get far if you don't put in that work. Okay. I mean, I think that sums it up beautifully. So let's talk about the actual change. Okay. Let's talk about impact. Um, as you saw these stats earlier, um, this is the past, right? The past. And in the past, you, if you don't know better, you can't you do better. Can't do better. Let's take them to the future. So while we still got a ways to go, <laughs> if this doesn't give y'all goosebumps, what does? Look, I mean, this is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of living, breathing animals. Wet noses, as Marcus says. Your pets in your house are alive because of these, because of these changes that were made in Pine Bluff. What do those changes actually look like? Let's take five months, okay, from January to May in 2019 compared to January to May in 2023. What does that actually look like? Each one of these paw prints is your family pet sitting on your bed. Each one of these paw prints is your little muddy dog trying to get your kitchen floors muddy up. <laughs> Each one of them. Each one. Oh, we're not done yet. 294 animals in a, in a span of five months is the difference, okay? Five months. Five months. What? Massive, massive, massive impact. We talked about euthanasia earlier. Okay, a lot of us raised our hands and said that we have euthanized. And I want to be ultra real with you for a second. When you see that life slip away, you know, it, it hurts. It hurts you. And everybody here that's ever done that before knows the feeling. A lot of times it's out of sight, out of mind. Oh, they do that. That department does that. But if you've had to do it personally and you've watched that life slip away, you'll know why this change is so important. It sucks. And the people within these facilities that are doing the euthanasias are going home every night and having to wear that burden of death, okay? Marcus, I can pretty cleanly say that because of the changes that you've made, your staff does not wear that burden of death on a day-to-day -day basis. They do not. And that is the impact, okay? That is the change in energy whenever you walk into a shelter. That is the, the smiling face at the front desk. That are these, those are these adoption programs, the volunteer program exploding, the foster program exploding, TNR program getting legs. All of these different things happen. It's like a snowball effect. It starts rolling downhill. You gain momentum. You gain traction. And now, look at all these family pets. Goosebumps, I'm telling y'all. 300%. Adoptions went up 300%. I don't even know how that works in data. Is there somebody, <laughs> is somebody smart enough to explain to me how you get a 300% increase on something? I don't know. But that's what I was told. Um, Marcus, so you're not done yet, though, right? We're not done. Um, we have a lot of, we have a long way to go. But it starts as something as simple as you guys see that truck? We got that truck last year where we had first, we had cages that didn't have any type of air moving in them. So we were able to get new trucks. That building that you guys see, we call that our old building. We're actually gonna revitalize that sometime next year. So we're gonna actually, we're doing TNR and the CC, we're doing the CCP and TNR program, but we're gonna actually make that bigger and better. And you heard Nick say this a lot, data. We're gonna start using data on a lot of our outcomes to make our shelter boom 100 percent. and data 
Um, raise your hand if you use data. We love data and, and best friends, Lord knows. Um, and, I, and I've become a data person. I haven't always been. I know dogs, cats, and people. Okay, I don't know anything about apps. I just had to download the Cvent app right before this to make sure I was in the right place for yes. God's sakes. <laughs> no lies. But ever since I heard this quote, and Sue Cosby said this quote years ago, she said, behind every number is a nose. When I heard that, that comment right there, I became the biggest data-centric person you've ever met in your life because it speaks to something that I'm passionate about. And so, talking about the use of data and how we can be proactive in not only law enforcement, but also all of our life-saving programs as well. Where are the least amount of veterinarians in Pine Bluff? We can use data to find that out. And then through that, that decision-making, that data-driven decision-making, we can now funnel resources into areas that need it the most because of these veterinary deserts. Okay, we're looking at law enforcement. How can we use data to, to be proactive in law enforcement? Where are the most dogs running at large? We're gonna go out there and we're not gonna do the old school sweep, okay? I was an animal control officer for many years, okay? And before our transition took place, we used to do sweeps. Mm -hmm. We would go into certain areas of Atlanta and we would pick up as many dogs as we could. It was a broken system. Do you know why? Because we would do it again next month. And then the month after that, and then the month after that, and then the month after that, and then the month after we, we were doing what we had always done with no results. What is the definition of insanity? It's doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. So now we can start to use data and we can say, where are the least amount of animals, or where are the most amount of animals running at large? And we're gonna sweep it. We're just gonna do it with toolboxes, a smile and resources because mm -hmm. we're out here to fix some fences today mm -hmm. okay this is how we get proactive in preventing these situations from happening again so we're not going to the same house for the same thing over and over and over again think about the amount of money also as of yesterday we have gotten our first reading for microchipping so we will be starting microchipping in Pine Bluff, arkansas within the next month so this is a true reflection of America, okay? We oftentimes come to these big national conferences and we hear these, these robust agencies, which by the way, I love those two, by the way, Spencer. <laughs> <laughs> I love them, okay? They, they really are the ones that drive the changes in our country, 150%. But if you take a step back and you look at the amount of shelters in this country, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of them are similar to Pine Bluff. There's not a lot of resources out there. There's not a lot of people in these communities. There's not a lot. And this is a true reflection of America. So um, I want to try my best before I break out these common denominators, okay? And I do have what I would consider to be the privilege of perspective because I get the opportunity to travel the country and I get to see agencies all across the country, East Coast to West Coast, meeting people, shaking hands. I was just in Cincinnati, I've been in uh, Texas, all over the place. And so I think I've been able to kind of fine tune my own personal thoughts on common denominators with successful agencies in this country. Before I get to that, I wanna tell a quick story. Pine Bluff, Arkansas, first time I was there, riding in, the, riding in an animal control truck, and there was this great Pyrenees running loose. The great Pyrenees runs off into the bushes. We end up confining this dog. The officer I was with, who's no longer with Pine Bluff, um, actually was able to locate the owner, but did not bring the dog back to the owner because they, he, we can't. We can't. Because we can't. And I said, why not? Right? And as simple as that may sound, it really broke a ton of rust off of the gears of change. And it started to be like, well, I guess I don't know why not, because we've always done it that way. Um, shortly after, that dog went back to its owner. And shortly after, Marcus started on his own implementing fee-waived uh, return to owners from the shelter. Okay? This allows people to be able to get their dog back without having that financial burden. My dog got loose last week. Okay? Has anybody's dog gotten loose before? <laughs> it happens. Yes. Put yourself in the shoes of somebody who may not have a lot. Mm -hmm. And let's say you get home from work and you got a hanger on your door. It says, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, can find your dog. Come down to the shelter. X, Y, it's very governmental, very, well, I don't even have, have enough money to think about light bills next month. 
how am I going to go pay all this money to Pine Bluff, Arkansas to get my dog back and at the same time get a citation and at the same time take work off so that I can go to court and at the same time pay that citation fee? It's not logical. So what happens? Owner surrender is one. Now you're faced with caring for this animal, cost mm -hmm. of care. It's a financial burden. What else happens? Well, what does that person do? That's another option. That happens sometimes. They get another dog. And where do they get that dog? They don't get it from you. From a breeder, from the streets. It's, mm -hmm. it's a broken Facebook. relationship. Yep. And so we are further cementing the narrative of the old school dog catcher, the Disney dog catcher running around with a net, with the net, trying, <laughs> trying to ruin everybody's day, you know, just falling over themselves, the evil one. We're starting to break the, gear, the, the gears of change here. And uh, you already saw the statistics. Now, can you talk to us a little bit about how the community responded? They are actually understanding and liking the fact that we aren't charging for everything that we're doing. So they're loving it. They're loving, loving it. it. They're, I'm um, loving they're it. loving it. Um, they're loving the impact that we are making loving the the fact that we are trying to do better than what we were doing we're not looking through a rearview mirror as we're driving this car we're looking at the street that's ahead of us got that right common denominators one non-complacent leadership okay leadership that is not okay with where they are currently today okay that is a ultimate common denominator with every successful agency i have seen i am not okay with where we are i want to do better e even some of the best shelters in this country still have this mindset no matter who you are, if you're always striving to get better, you will get better as long as you don't quit and you have perseverance. Follow through. Whitney talked about this on one of the interviews earlier, okay? Marcus stepped up and he did what he said he was going to do. I cannot tell y'all how many directors, how many leaders I have talked to. Anybody in this room knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, we're going to get there. Well, yeah, when the time's right, we're going to do it. No, step up and knock it out. Okay, right now, do it. That's what this man did. Unified vision with the staff. Okay, I look at the staff as like a quilt. The first time I went to Pine Bluff, Arkansas, this quilt was shredded. There was no direction. The only thing there was Marcus trying to hold on to the quilt so that it at least didn't fall down. Second time I went there, it is a completely seamed Built. Everybody was on the same page. Everybody knew the direction they were going and everybody could speak to all of these concepts. They could speak to return to owner. They could speak to TNR. They could speak to X, Y, and Z. It was a unified staff with a unified mission. And that is a common denominator for successful agencies in this country. The ability to network and the gusto to get out there and find out. Okay. This is not only talking about national. Okay. We're talking about local. Local police departments, building relationships, okay? Local human services, local everything. Get out there and network. Second part of this is national, okay? If you are an agency that does not have a ton of money. Reach out. Reach out. Reach out. Reach on to someone. <laughs> and, if you, and if you have any questions about how to reach out, our emails are right here. Feel free to take a picture. <laughs> Don't hesitate, okay? Take a picture of these emails and reach out. Even if you're not, even if you just wanted to say what you're doing, good. Maybe I can take some of that and share it with others throughout this opportunity that I have to travel the country and meet folks. Um, we have about one minute left. Is that about right? We're spot on. Any questions real quick before we cut out? I know I just ranted through this whole thing, but look, I'm fired up. I'm passionate. We got a question. <laughs> I will. I will do that. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Let's go. He said, I, he said I will. I will. And I already laid the foundation that he does what he says. Okay. <laughs> he can't. He can't. He can't back out now. This. This is something brand new to me, and I want to thank you guys for actually listening, and coming here and enjoying the presentation. This is something that I don't take lightly. My wife can tell you I'm not a talkative person. I step in the background, but I get things done. But I do want you to take something from here. If you want to make change, it starts within yourself. So change yourself and then you can change others. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>